weary traveller, you have found yourself in another Balti series, and you're looking at tackling the beast that is End Display. So we all know Unreal Engine's had this virtual production edge been going on for a while, and End Display is a pivotal part of that. If you start getting into the world of rendering a single Unreal project on multiple screens, End Display is awesome for this because you can allot screen space and send it out to different machines using End Display combined with Switchboard. Switchboard is amazing for launching remote instances of Unreal. With End Display and Switchboard, you can make multiple machines work together on the same project at the same time with Genlock's time-coded uh, takes of your main Unreal Engine instance running. Um, and as a result, you can render massive, massive things using the power of all the machines combined. It's a super powerful tool used for virtual production, but it's also used for anything that involves rendering stuff across multiple screens. The end display is a scary beast, it's a very scary thing, but uh, I've made this little tutorial series in order to tackle it, and as a result I've found a load of insanely useful combinations between the off-world live, live streaming toolkit and end display. So I'm really, really excited to show you these. It's actually blown some of my creative processes out the water. Uh, it's gone from being quite a technical thing that I don't really understand to something that I can really play around with. And as a result of my learnings, learning, I managed to knock together this kind of pre for a real-time playable anamorphic screen. This could be a massive skyscraper advertisement and I could be sat in the corner going tee hee hee and playing this game in real time while people stare at the illusion and in amazement and wonder of how the hell somebody put this together. Wizardry, that's what we're here for. So the off world Live Toolkit has really helped me out with getting out the inner and outer frostums of your, uh, uh, of your end display screens. You can uh, pass the render target into a corner of your screen so you can play your standalone little end display config on its own. Uh, or you can media capture or send by NDI or spout any part of your end display config. These two tools combined are really powerful and uh, you then just get a whole lot more flexibility when working on these projects. The key thing here is the off world live viewport capture. End display works with viewports and we have a thing that captures them. So therefore you can send that out. Loads of really cool little tips and tricks here. So this series on end display is gonna be mad cool. I thought I'd start off just running through this start to finish process of how I got going with my end display config and what it enabled me to do, namely this real-time playable anamorphic illusion uh, as just an exciting example. Then I've put together the rest of these lessons to hopefully just kind of demystify and display a bit. I don't know if I can take you all the way, Traveller, but I will definitely be able to hopefully make you a bit more comfortable using end display. Realise that it's actually quite a malleable tool uh, if you understand it, and hopefully these videos will just kind of get you going. Um, sick. Yeah, I'm really excited to share this. I hope you guys benefit from from this. I hope this answers some questions and shows some very key things that the toolkit can do to be super useful when combined with end display. But let's jump into it, I'll show you this project overview and then we've got some more specific tutorials coming up after. <laughs> So here's my astounding deep storyline based driven game. Uh, you play as a frog and you are stuck in a box for eternity and balloons keep spawning on tick forever and ever. And yeah, this is all I wanted. Just something dynamic that you can run around in. I can run around in this box and it can be projected on some billboards in real time. So here's my end display config. It's sending out a low res version of what you can see, uh, but that's just a preview. It can send out a higher res as well. So you can see from here, it looks 3D. You got the illusion of depth, but from here, it's really skewed. And this is what you need to actually give that illusion of depth. You need this skewed image so that when you map it onto a flat plane, yeah, you got that, you got that feeling of depth from the kind of perspective, the way the perspective joins, yeah. So clever stuff, using, using perspective, camera eye, magic tricks to, to turn a flat plane into um, a, a deep cut out image. And for my example, so, so the idea with end display is that you've got this config and you can send out, you can send out the maps as flat images. So here you can see from a certain viewpoint, that will line up with its background and give a perfect illusion of the kind of depth, you know, if you're in the right place. Uh, and then these flat maps here are 
uh, projected into this viewport here and you can send out this viewport uh, as a standalone running thing you can even add ip addresses to these nodes and that means that someone else running switchboard running unreal engine uh, you can launch an instance of switchboard on another computer which means you'll get more processing power to render really high res images so i'm just doing a test for now so i'm rendering it all just on my computer and i can launch i can launch switchboard which runs runs this as a mini kind of game uh, that i can play and in real time send out these textures to wherever i want i've also got a little viewport here so that when i'm running this as a standalone program i can see what i'm doing as the frog running around and i've used the off-world live live streaming camera to add a texture target uh, which is what is seen from the camera i can add that as a little box in my viewport so i can play that at runtime so the idea of this is that i make a in this in this case i made a recording for a bit of previs just to kind of show what's going on and then i map the image onto this cube and you know as you can see from the right angle you got the illusion that this cube is uh cut out and you can see the map crosses over nicely. You've got this illusion of depth. You've got the real-time aspect. I could just be sat playing this. And uh, also this workflow, really, really editable. Um, you, could get, you can get real loose with this stuff. Um, yeah. So imagine just playing this, you know, playing this in real time. Gives the illusion of depth. Make people freak out in real life. And uh, yeah, amazing workflow. So let me just share with you an overview of how I went about making that, really. So step one, I just made a cube. Everything starts with a good old cube. Um, made a bit of a block out of what kind of bounds I want my scene to be in. Now you should really uh, block everything out and make sure everything's running and working before you uh, go ahead and do the fun stuff. But I just worked out all the end display stuff. So I felt like treating myself. I started work on making the balloons and making the kind of dynamic blueprints for those balloons. Uh, Cause I just, I wanted to do something fun. So yeah, hooking up these balloon blueprints, it's just fun looking at something dynamic in your scene really. So I started modeling some balloons as well. Uh, I forgot what balloons looked like, so I had to Google it. And then I modeled based off of those images, made some variations on the balloons as well. Just had a few meshes to pick from, made a couple material slots for some of these balloons so that once they're in Unreal, Unreal can recognize that there's a few different materials going on. When exporting these balloons, I had to make sure they're all at the zero position before exporting them separately from Blender to Unreal. Uh, I then wanted to export some stuff from another Unreal project, but I couldn't open a level. So I had to go into the config file uh, and change the startup level for my uh, editor. So that, that's, a, that's a little tip. If you un open things in Unreal 5.1 and you can't open the level anymore, you can just change the, the level that it opens. So I fixed that and I fixed up the materials for my balloons, uh, made sure they looked all nice in Unreal and everything, and then loaded them into my balloon spawner blueprint and played around with that a little bit. So now lovely example. Here's what I wanted to import from the other level. I wanted my frog third person uh, blueprint. I didn't want to make a whole third person blueprint straight away. Uh, all over again so migrated it over from an old level uh, old project making sure all the right files were being copied over so with my frog now migrated to my new project um, i was ready to uh, pop that in my level and give it a little play test uh, and i realized i forgot to hook up the controls so when you do this there's probably going to be a lot of input action mappings you need to auto possess your player zero and you need to re-add these axis and action mappings uh, where you get a warning so once you once you do that your blueprint should work absolutely fine in your new project it's actually not not too much work to get that running and yeah so now literally most of the functionality of my little played level playable level is uh is all good i just changed the import scale uh, for all of these and re-imported them just so they're a little bit smaller and yeah that's pretty much it's pretty much most of the dynamics for this kind of level sorted i thought i'd add some balloons on strings as well just so they're in one place uh, this was part of the tutorial I was following as well. Shouts out to the real smart people making these tutorials. I'm just following. I thought I'd drag some more assets from my old level again to get the textures and things going on. And I started to block out the, the actual kind of space for my anamorphic screen to be sat in. Yeah, this is taking shape, taking shape pretty nice. Here's a little playable thing that you can just run around in as an example, you know, 
not too bad. Uh, I then got to work a little bit more on the setting. I tend to do this. This is bad practice, but I tend to get a bit deep into the setting first off before I even know if it works. Uh, I added some dynamic lights so that when he runs into certain areas, when the balloons pass certain areas, it causes the lights to flash. And here we go. This is pretty much pretty much there, dyna dynamics wise. So here's the thing. I'm gonna play, and um, yeah, at least we know that runs. So jumping into end display, I pulled in an old config that I made before just to kind of check it out, see what was going on. You could change it. You can change the size on the fly. Obviously, you might want to get a bit more detailed with the measuring and making sure the size is all right. But for me, I was just making this example. As long as the screens end up being something like 1920 by 1080, uh, I'm pretty happy. And the viewport, I'm just going to eyeball for now. The viewpoint, I'm just going to eyeball that for now, really. So I kind of decided to go back to making a bit more of a simple block out just to have something a bit cleaner, a bit easier to run to test out my end display to make sure everything's running all right. This is a bit better practice. You want to make sure the functionality is there before you make it look pretty. But I wanted to do the pretty bit as well. So I made a new folder for my end display stuff and uh, made a new end display config just from scratch. Uh, and here it is. It gives you this one viewport. Uh, I used my command prompt to find my IP address uh, just so I could send it to my own IP address for this test. And I created my first uh, set of nodes. So I used this kind of end display uh, config setup to lay out my viewports and the sizes. And this is just trying to get the most resolution out of uh, my one screen that I'm using. Um, and yeah, just laying out these viewports uh, in, in my space on my window. Then also you can just drag in static meshes. So I dragged in my basic kind of block out mesh uh, actually into my end display config because then you just got some visual reference of what what's going on where your screens are so end display configs need a default viewpoint this tells you uh what what your perspective is it's kind of projecting the image uh, onto your flat planes uh, from this viewpoint i needed to grab some screens from another existing end display config because they're all nicely uv mapped i wanted to copy and paste those into my own config and now I know I've just got some nice screens to work with that have been set up properly. I set those to be uh, projected onto these nodes so that the screens will fill some screen space in my window. And I uh, made these a child of an end display transform node, which is a nice little null that lets you kind of transform uh, the two screens together or else the scale and stuff would be all out of whack. Use a little bit of maths to make a 19 by 20 uh, square and drag that back into my level. So yeah, I can still run around as a frog, little frog break. And yeah, my end display is going pretty well. I thought I'd test this on switchboard. So to see when I launch this remotely, uh, is this still going to work? Am I still going to be able to run around as the frog? So I set my end display config as a standalone running thing and launched it remotely. Remember, this could mean you could launch this onto someone else's computer so they could render a whole massive high res scene. For me, I'm just doing this pre -vis, so it's uh, all inside my one screen. But yes, success. I can run around as the frog in this standalone version of Unreal that I've just launched remotely. That is crazy. That's really, really cool. I think that's that's awesome. The dynamics work. It all, yeah, it all runs. He runs around. So little standalone game complete. I'm going to move everything back to my more dynamic, cool scene. And now I've got two meshes there uh, and I'm going to drop my frog back in. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to hide hide this end display mesh, uh, hide this static mesh in my end display by setting it to hidden in game and just turning off visible as well. So now I've just got the end display screens and they are overlaid over my static meshes that I've already set up before. Um, so yeah, I've got a lot of screen space off the corner there. Uh, I'm just making sure the end display screen is in the right place. And last minute, just <laughs> changing the size of the whole thing. Very unprofessional but who said I'm a professional? So here I'm just adding some more messages, some more pretty things and making it nighttime because it's cool. And here we go. It runs. It r this is so this is this is the party. All good. I thought I'd add some balloon popping mechanics quickly just because uh, I was finding I had to have a way to get rid of the balloons. So I just did that simply. And added some more particles because I spent too long on the visuals. Here's adding the off-world live viewport capture. Really simple way to make that standalone game recordable. And you can link that with a off-world live media output and stream it out, or you could save it to a file. That That is a really simple way to save your end display viewport. Save it, send it out to other places, do all sorts of cool things with it. So with my viewport capture in place, I should be able to launch this switchboard game and have it come up in a new window. 
And here we go. I've just sent it out to OBS for now using the Spout Sender. We have our standalone game running and we also have a replication of the whole thing as a media feed, a media output, a Spout output or a NDI output. So this is all good, it's running, but still I can't see what I'm doing because I'm a silly frog in a box that has no vision. So after making it look pretty once again, because I'm all about that, I uh, jumped into my third person character and added an owl capture to my existing Cinecam, added a render target to that at a fairly low resolution. And now I can pump out the third person view from the frog to wherever I want. So I'm going to pump it into my end display config. Super cool. All I need to do to set this up is just add it as another uh, viewport in my kind of node viewport system. A little window in the corner. I can use this viewport override to pump in the real time updating render target as a texture overlay for this viewport window. So that's a really nice way to just get a little, a little visual in your standalone sort of switchboard launch instance of Unreal. So now I can see what I'm doing. I'm running around and I'm still pumping out those two textures in real time to wherever they want to go. So now just as a previs, I'm just going to cut my recording that I made uh, in Premiere, export it, export it out. I could have just done a direct media output using the out media output. And then I'm just going to make a mesh in Blender uh, and do some dodgy UV mapping to just give you this previs and show how this is a flat cube yet when viewed from the right perspective looks like it's got a cut out from it and the frog running around in real time is awesome stuff just imagine if this was displaying on a giant billboard or a giant corner of screens and you can just sit and play this in real time and people can just watch your simulation going on uh, this real time illusion is super impressive super fun so there it is the anamorphic box so damn useful for so many things i'm really happy with it they're looking into a fish tank for pure live streaming glory so the awesome thing about this is i can i can send this to so many different places i edit my end display config i can right click here and add a new cluster, cluster node as long as that's got the right ip address for the, com for the computer that's going to be rendering the screen um you can add that compile and save that now I can delete this out. I can just cut. I can just control X, control V, control X, control V. You know, I can just paste this one in here. And maybe I want this to be. So I've just got the one the one screen. Oh, save. Now when I saw launch switchboard listener, launch switchboard, close Unreal. When I launch that, uh, it's still just compiling some shaders and stuff. But yeah, we're getting the one screen. That's super cool, super useful. We can now send this one screen out via, via NDI, SRT. I've actually got it upside down there. But yeah, we can send this out by NDI, SRT, or Spout to a screen. We've got this whole screen, all this all this screen real estate, as uh, the pros use that term. You've got the full 1920 by 1080 image for the one screen. Mad useful. Let's just do another example for that. Maybe I want, maybe I want just the little game playthrough and a little, a smaller preview of what's going on uh, on, the, on the screen. You know, this could be useful for sending out via NDI to the person who's playing the little anamorphic game. So with that all saved, back in switchboard, I'll reconnect to that, launch my node. And once the shaders have compiled, yeah, we've got a whole other, whole other setup. So this, you can see that you can have some machines rendering the outer frustum, the outer end display config, the viewports for the anamorphic box. You can have NDI sending, NDI or spout sending to your person who's playing the real time anamorphic billboard game while still seeing in the corner the previews of what the projections are looking like. Or you can have a whole other kind of setup um, and this switchboard can handle the nodes. So as long as you've got some valid IP addresses for each node that you've set up, they should all populate down here. And I can just uh, re-add that device I can repopulate. Uh, I can go and just n anamorphic. Okay, and now we've got the option to launch from our main switchboard user. All of these nodes. Now it's failing to find these two IP addresses because they're not real IP addresses. But if they're real IP addresses, you should be able to link to them. Super cool. So yeah, hopefully you can see that how malleable this would be in a studio setting with multiple machines. Um, incredibly useful with this kind of setup in place. I've got stuff like the viewport capture actor, which I can unpause the rendering on. And I've got the spout sender that's picking up that same owl output. 
Now in OBS, I grab my spout source and just lay out spout out. I might need to change that to standalone when it jump when it pops up. But if we do the same thing, launch switchboard. Cool. Once switchboard's popped up, you can see that the spout. Uh, spout output is sending. We got the first available sender, but we can also pick the end of play spout out standalone. That's popped up. We got that there and dragging it in. We've got our whole config that's been picked up by the viewport capture and I'm sending that out to OBS once again. So pictures within pictures <laughs> within pictures. Um, but you can see that you can just use spout to send this out to a screen or something. Amazing studio potential here. Um, very little latency. Spout is basically no latency. Amazing malleability with where you're sending your screens and things. Crazy useful. Oh my god, I hope you like that end display run through. I hope this excites you. I hope you can understand what's going on here. And if you can't, I've got a whole series of videos uh, in this playlist <laughs> that that was a good plug. That was a good plug. Feel free to use these tutorials to learn, learn some more stuff about how you can use end display. There's a billion different uses for this if you're making kind of installation stuff or any kind of uh, illusions. Um, yeah, I'm feeling <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling buzzed at what I've learned with end display and hopefully uh, you guys can pick it up too from these videos. So yeah, feel free to dive in and learn some more real-time madness. Let's go. Balti series, end display, boom.